America's number one news. Tonight, an incredible test of endurance in one of the world's hottest places, the Sahara Desert. The six-day, 155-mile marathon will take runners until Friday to finish. 672 athletes from 41 countries are taking part. Organizers wait until the fall every year to start to avoid the extreme heat, but this year, temperatures did not cooperate. The opening stage saw highs of 115 degrees. Her mother was at the center of one of the country's most bitter debates and fought for the right to have her aborted. But she was born anyway and given up for adoption. Tonight, an ABC News Prime exclusive, for the first time ever on camera, the woman who was thought of only as the Roe baby is ready to tell her story. Your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history. Mm -hmm. What's the impact? on you now. Why did she decide now was the time to give her first television interview? And what does she want you to know tonight about the secret she kept for years until now? And tonight, the protests and controversy as the Supreme Court hears in-person arguments for the first time since the pandemic began. The justices set to weigh in on some of the most divisive cases in decades on abortion, gun rights, and the death penalty. What you need to know ahead of the big term. The social media giant in the dark today, Facebook crippled by a global outage. At the same time, under fire from a former employee turned whistleblower. That whistleblower coming forward with alarming claims, accusing the social media giant of choosing profit over safety and knowingly allowing its platforms to be used to spread misinformation and hate. Tonight, the race to slow the oil up to 130,000 gallons pouring from an underwater pipeline into the ocean off the coast of California. Beach town sounding the alarm about the impact of tourism. Popular beaches facing the prospect of days or weeks of closures. Emergency teams rushing to contain the impact. This is we're getting some of the first images of the impact on wildlife. And he's had the number one album in the world, played with some of the greatest rockers of all time. Tonight, our conversation with a legend in his own right, Peter Frampton, about the highs and lows of his decades in music. Ooh, baby, I love the way Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us as we begin yet another busy work week. The Supreme Court is now back in session, and over the weekend, thousands of women marched in cities and towns all across the country. Women of all stripes coming together, galvanized by what some call an unprecedented attack on reproductive rights. The ability to get an abortion is among the biggest cases facing the Supreme Court this year, and many on both sides believe this could be the year Roe versus Wade is overturned. Turned. That landmark case was filed decades ago by this woman, Norma McCorvey, a.k.a. Jane Roe. To this day, it remains one of the most polarizing issues in American society. And now, just imagine if you were the baby whose biological mother famously fought to have you aborted. The burden and weight you might carry if you were then compelled to hold that secret for decades. We have a lot to get to tonight, from a massive social media outage to the latest on the fight against COVID. But we begin with the first television interview from the baby, now all grown up, at the heart of one of this nation's most bitter fights. A lot of people didn't know that I existed, that she was able to have the abortion. Shelley Lynn Thornton was two and a half years old, completely oblivious to her role in history on January 22, 1973, when the landmark case Roe v. Wade was decided in the Supreme Court. When you are able to really think about the idea that your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history, mm -hmm. what's the impact? on you now. I understand that it has nothing to do with me. It's, it doesn't revolve around me. I wasn't the one who like created this law. I'm not the one who created this movement. Her only involvement? She just happened to be at the center of an unwanted pregnancy her mother wanted to end. As much as this case was personal, seemingly pitting a mother against her unborn child, 
Publicly, it pitted Americans against each other. The country was deadlocked in a bitter moral battle over what constituted life. Is there any part of you that has ever given any thought to, boy, I'm kind of glad that law went into effect after I was born? I just don't think about it. To me, I want it to be a non-issue, so I ignore it, thinking that if I ignore it long enough and hard enough, it'll go away, <laughs> but it never does. And so, at 51 years old, after decades shrouded in secrecy, the woman who was thought of only as the Roe baby is ready to tell her story. Now you're confronting it, really. I've ignored it for this many years, and it hasn't gone away, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's like, now the only thing that I can do is just to meet it head on. Her biological mother, Norma McCorvey, a cleaning woman from Katy, Texas, was 22 when she found herself pregnant for the third time. By 1970, she'd already given up two of her girls for adoption, but it was a desire to terminate her third pregnancy that led Norma to file a lawsuit against the state of Texas. She never did have the procedure, but more than two years later, against tremendous odds, Norma, who filed anonymously under the pseudonym Jane Roe, won. The Supreme Court today ruled that abortion is completely a private matter to be decided by mother and doctor in the first three months of pregnancy. By that time, Norma's third baby, Shelly, was already a toddler growing up with a family she says she loved. What was it like growing up uh, with, with Ruth and Billy? I had the best time. It was always an adventure. There was always like something fun going on because we had a big family. And you felt loved? Oh yeah, completely, 100%. Did you ever look for your biological parents? No. But in 1989, Norma was looking for her. It was the same year actress Roseanne Barr had a media frenzied reunion with the daughter she gave up as a teen. And Shelley believes that Norma, seeing the attention it brought, wanted the same. You're 18, 10 days before your 19th birthday, and somebody says, what? I walked past this van, and these people, like, jumped out of this van and they were calling me and I turned around and they were like, are you Shelly? And I was, I go, yeah. And they were like, well, we, we've been looking for you. Shelly says she was tricked into meeting reporters from the National Enquirer who then revealed that her biological mother was Norma McCorvey, AKA Jane Roe, the poster child for abortion. My whole thinking is that, oh God, everybody's gonna hate me because everyone's gonna blame me for abortion being legal. I just completely broke down. For a long time, you kept it a secret. You didn't tell anybody who your biological mother was. What kind of weight was that and burden for you to carry that for so many years? It's a lot of weight. It's it's. It's pretty big. I feel that it was always hard for me to form relationships with people because I, I felt like I was always holding something back. Like they never really got like 100% me. I still carry that um, and I probably always will. As an 18 year old, had you thought anything about Roe v. Wade or abortion? I never really grew up knowing anything about abortion because it was just never, not a thing that was talked about in our family. Like if a family member had a baby, they couldn't take care of it, then somebody else in the family took it and took care of it. In the 80s, Roe v. Wade was quickly becoming a partisan issue. Many Republicans, like President Ronald Reagan, took a firm stance against it. We're told about a woman's right to control her own body, but doesn't the unborn child have a higher right, and that is to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And those angered by the ruling sometimes resorted to violence, killing lives in the name of saving them. They bombed the clinics because God told them to do it. In the decades since, there have been several challenges to the ruling, but none as serious as recent legislation. Mississippi, which only has one abortion clinic left, is going before the Supreme Court this fall to ask the conservative majority to throw out Roe and roll back abortion rights nationwide. While in Texas, where Norma sued for an abortion all those years ago, a recent bill known as SB8 has already succeeded at banning abortions after six weeks, with no exceptions for rape or incest, empowering civilians to enforce it with lawsuits against doctors who unlawfully perform the procedure. 
Clinics say it's effectively ended abortion in America's second most populated state and galvanized people on both sides. And while this decades-long debate continues to rage across the country, Shelley wants no parts of it. Concerned either side would be all too eager to make her the face of their movement. Do you have an opinion about whether women should be allowed to have abortions? I do. It's an opinion that I keep pretty close to my chest just because I don't want either side or both sides coming at me. I'm not going to let either side use me. Though people watching are going to say, oh, she has a cross on. That must be a message that, you know, it's her religious beliefs that she's trying to uh, convey without answering the question. No. So this, this cross is my sister cross. Um, Jennifer and I have matching necklaces so that we always have each other close. Jennifer Ferguson is Norma's second daughter, who she also gave up for adoption. Much like Shelley, she too grew up in a loving home with a doting mother and a father nicknamed Dr. Wonderful, who adored her. My childhood was, it was amazing. I had great parents, Donna and Steve, who raised me. My dad was an anesthesiologist. My mom worked in a podiatrist's office and my sister was in and out of college. I never did without. With one exception, it wasn't until about a decade ago that Shelley first met her half-sister, Jennifer. Unlike Shelley, Jennifer wasn't burdened by the knowledge that her birth mother tried to abort her. As a result, Jennifer's relationship with Norma was quite different from Shelley's. Since we're here in Texas, you lived all your life in Texas, and, and a big conversation now is SB8. Do you have thoughts on it? I think it's a, it's a little bit scary that people can judge how women, what they're going to do with their bodies. I, I, I have a problem with that. Um, not that I'm pro-choice, pro-life, 100% either side. I, I will always feel that it's wrong. Did you ever try to convince Shelly to meet Norma? No. I did not because I knew from a very early stage with Shelly what horrible things that Norma did to her as a young child, and I would never force that on her, ever. Norma was a complicated figure. When her lawyers, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, met her, she was seemingly the perfect candidate, a poor woman unable to afford the trip out of the state for an abortion. But what they got was a spitfire who took liberties with the truth and was haunted by a traumatic upbringing. Prior to her death, Norma would go on to switch sides multiple times, vacillating between pro-choice and pro-life, depending on which was more profitable and attention-grabbing at the time. Norma is a wild, a wild woman. She wants to be the center of attention. There was a, a major headline in June 1989. It says, National Enquirer finds Jane Rose baby. Mm -hmm. and, and Norma was quoted saying that she was ready to take her in my arms and give her my love and be her friend, her being you. Right. Did you ever feel that that was true? No. It became apparent to me really quickly that the only reason why she wanted to reach out to me and find me was because she wanted to use me for publicity. Have you forgiven her? No. Never will? No. Why? <sighs> A lot of reasons. Um, mostly because I feel that she could have handled things a lot better than she did. She could have been more upfront with what she actually wanted from me than trying to do, you know, like the warm mother-daughter reconciliation movie of the week kind of thing. Have you been able to reconcile being this unwilling participant in history? <laughs> yes and no, but I think a lot of people don't understand that Norma was taken advantage of in her circumstances, but I think she also took advantage of both sides. 
Norma passed in 2017, once again shocking the world before she died with the revelation that she was paid by the pro-life movement to switch sides in the FX doc, a.k.a. Jane Roe. This is my deathbed confession. <laughs> Did they use you as a trophy? Of course. I was the big fish. She passed away before Jennifer could make it to the hospital. And while Shelley considered going to visit Norma on her deathbed, ultimately, she decided against it. Why did you decide never to meet Norma? She didn't deserve to meet me. She, she never did anything um, in her life to get that privilege back. She never... Um, she never expressed genuine feeling for me or genuine remorse for doing the things that she did, saying the things that she did. So you have no regrets that you never met her? No regrets. Norma once said of her daughters that she gave them a chance at living by giving them away. This was a birthday. But what they're most grateful for is that she gave them each other. What do you all bring to each other's lives at this point? Support. Comfort. Most definitely. Togetherness. Yeah. Family. Family. Yeah. Our sincerest thanks to both Shelley and Jennifer for their trust and sharing their story with us. More on the Supreme Court revisiting Roe versus Wade coming up later on in the show. Now to the social media giant in the dark for hours. Facebook's three billion users unable to access the site for most of the day. But tonight the popular site is slowly coming back online. This comes as a former employee turned whistleblower has come forward claiming Facebook's platforms amplify hate, misinformation, and political unrest. Terry Moran reports. Tonight, major outages affecting billions of users of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. All of it starting this morning and continuing through the day. All of the sites owned by Facebook. In a statement, Facebook acknowledging they are experiencing network issues and teams are working as fast as possible to debug and restore. All this chaos coming just hours after Facebook's whistleblower revealed her identity overnight on CBS's 60 Minutes. Frances Hogan worked at Facebook for two years but left in May after her Civic Integrity Unit was disbanded following the 2020 election. She leaked thousands of pages of internal Facebook research that she says shows the social media giant knowingly stokes divisions, spreads misinformation, and harms younger users for its own profit. The version of Facebook that exists today is tearing our societies apart. Hogan saying the more anger Facebook users are exposed to, the more time they spend on the site and the more content they consume. Facebook makes more money when you consume more content. People enjoy engaging with things that elicit an emotional reaction. And the more anger that they get exposed to, the more they interact and more they consume. Misinformation, angry content yeah. is enticing to people it's and keep, keeps them on the platform. Yes. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. Hogan says Facebook put some safeguards in place leading up to the 2020 election to cut down on misinformation and anger, but then... As soon as the election was over, they turned them back off or they changed the settings back to what they were before to prioritize growth over safety. Facebook pushing back hard hours after the 60 Minutes piece aired. Every day, our teams have to balance protecting the ability of billions of people to express themselves openly with the need to keep our platform a safe and positive place. Social media competitor Twitter appearing to try to capitalize on this, tweeting, hello, literally everyone. But tonight, Twitter reporting slowdowns, too. Terry Moran joins us from the Hill tonight. Terry, the whistleblower plans to testify tomorrow before Congress. And viewers may be wondering how she was able to leave Facebook with those internal documents and if she faces any legal exposure for that. It's a good question, Lindsay. Now, she says that she managed to get those documents out over a two-month period, and no, she does not face any retaliation. She is protected under the SEC's whistleblower program uh, because Facebook is a publicly traded company, and the law prevents publicly traded companies from retaliating against whistleblowers. Facebook, as it gradually and the other apps come back online, has issued a statement saying, to everyone who was affected by the outages on our platforms today, we say... 
We are sorry. And as they come back online, no word as to whether or not that massive global outage was related at all to the whistleblower's revelations. Lindsay? So many conspiracy theories around that. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. Joining us now is Roger McNamee, an early investor in Facebook who advised co-founder Mark Zuckerberg. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, what do you make of the outage today that took down Facebook and platforms like Instagram and WhatsApp for hours? How big of a problem is this? So, Lindsay, I think they're, the timing of this is a spectacular coincidence. There are a lot of potential causes. The key thing is Facebook is so large that they manage their internet infrastructure inside the company, which is, you know, smaller companies obviously have someone on the outside who does it. But Facebook does all their own. So this was internal to Facebook. The most likely explanation is they were doing an upgrade or something and simply made a mistake and that brought everything down. I mean, obviously, there are other possibilities, but that is by far the most likely one. The timing is just brilliant, because at a moment in time when a whistleblower has explained why each and every one of us should be incredibly cautious about going on to Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, the sites go down and give us an opportunity to experience how much better our lives are without them. How much better our lives are without them. Wow, okay, well, a lot of people might disagree with that. As certainly uh, the conspiracy theories abound. Uh, this week, a former Facebook employee came forward as the source of tens of thousands of leaked documents behind the Wall Street Journal's reports about a number of challenges facing the company. What was the most troubling revelation from these reports in your mind? Well, so to me, the most important thing I take away from it is that Francis Haugen is an incredibly courageous incredibly authoritative and utterly convincing spokesman for this issue. And what she's done is to bring forward clear evidence that Facebook's business model, which is to say the entire way the company operates, is structured in such a way that harm is not only inevitable, it's unavoidable. And that the management team at every opportunity has chosen to protect the business model rather than to protect the country. So whether it's related to COVID disinformation, whether it's related to the insurrection, whether it's related to human trafficking or protecting teenage girls from uh, all kinds of psychological damage, Facebook every single time has opted to protect its business model. And again, the challenge we've all faced is we have known this for a long time, but we never had the inside documentation that proved that the management team not only knew, but persisted in their behavior in spite of what they knew. And that is what Ms. Haugen has done here. And for that, I mean, she's just a hero. And that might be a bit of a preview of what you can expect for tomorrow. The whistleblower, as you said, Frances Haugen, she's gonna testify uh, before the Senate on Tuesday. What are you hoping to hear tomorrow? And what can Washington do to change the way Facebook operates? Yeah, so Lindsay, that is exactly the right question. I think what Francis Haugen has done here is to eliminate the last excuse for inaction, not only by Congress, which needs to pass laws related to safety, privacy, and competition, but also the judiciary. Because what is clear from her work and the work of other activists is that Facebook has, whether on purpose, but more likely inadvertently, crossed lines and done things that are actually felonies. And those things need to be investigated and if the investigations pan out, prosecute it. And what I hope will happen at the hearing tomorrow is that she will give evidence that will provide the, the motivation to Congress to do its part, to do what it did to food and drugs at the beginning of the 20th century when the country was threatened by the lack of safety in food production and the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, to do what we did to the chemicals industry in the 60s when we decided that we didn't want the health risk and the environmental risk of indiscriminate dumping of toxic waste. And we've been down this road before, and it's Congress's job to fix that. So safety first, then privacy, because we have to protect the citizens from the use of data to manipulate what they believe, to manipulate the choices available to them. That is going to require a different set of laws. And then lastly, we need competition laws that allow new companies to create alternative, much safer models and be able to get those to market without fear of being crushed by monopolists. And Mr. McNamee, one more question before I let you go. So obviously you were an investor early on, so you liked what you saw in Facebook. At what point did that change? And am I correct in assuming that you don't use Facebook or Instagram? 
So you're correct in both things. So I w was an advisor to Mark Zuckerberg from 2006 to 2009. I helped him solve a problem in the company back when, in the days when Facebook, in fact, required everybody to have authenticated identity and actually offered real privacy controls. And I stopped working with him in 2009 because I thought he'd outgrown his need for my kind of input. I became first concerned in the early uh, 2010s, but realistically, it didn't kick in until the beginning of 2016. And I reached out to Mark and Cheryl in October of 2016, right before the election, because I was convinced that the culture, business model, and algorithms of Facebook were allowing bad people to harm innocent people in the context of democracy and civil rights. And I gave them a bunch of evidence. And I hope that they, as friends of mine and people I had mentored, would respond and do the right thing. But it didn't work out, so I became an activist. Roger McNamee, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate you coming on the show. Entirely my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now to the all-out effort to contain a massive oil spill off the California coast tonight. An underwater pipeline ruptured over the weekend, sending as much as 130,000 gallons of oil rushing into the ocean. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has the very latest. Tonight, crews racing to contain one of the largest oil spills in California history. Up to 130,000 gallons of crude have leaked into the Pacific Ocean off Orange County, killing wildlife and shutting down some of the state's most iconic shorelines. Officials say the pipeline, which is the source of the leak, is 17 and a half miles long. The spill located in this area, about four and a half miles off the coast of Huntington Beach. Late today, divers pinpointing a key area of concern. The Coast Guard looking into the possibility that a ship's anchor caused the rupture. These ships are uh, anchored and many are waiting entry and uh, in the course of transit, it is, it is possible that they would transit over a pipeline. Teams on boats deploying boom to contain the oil, others scooping it up with skimmers, desperately trying to prevent the nearly 13 square mile slick from spreading further down a coastline teeming with wildlife. Hopefully this doesn't turn out too bad. You know, I'm just concerned about the, the sea life and the birds. We went out on the water and saw it firsthand. So I just bent down and this is what I scooped up. This is the kind of oil that's being leaked and you can see that it's hardened once it hits the water, but the ocean here is covered with this stuff. Fish and wildlife experts rescuing birds from that sludge. Residents here devastated. Well, it's heartbreaking. I, I'm, I live here locally and I just came down to see how widespread it was. And it's quite disappointing. The CEO of Amplify Energy, the company that owns the pipeline, saying they notify the Coast Guard early Saturday of a possible spill and capped both ends of the pipe by Sunday, claiming no more oil was leaking. The company releasing a statement today saying it's working cooperatively with officials on the scene. Matt Gutman joins us now. And Matt, you're also warning about a nearly decade old report warning about a situation just like this. That document, Lindsay, outlines a scenario in which 3,000 barrels of oil spilled into the Pacific. That's pretty much the sum total of oil in that 17-mile-long pipeline. And that's what they fear has happened here. Uh, that report also says that if such a spill were to happen, it would cause significant and substantial harm to the environment. Lindsay. Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. A new era began in New York City today after the COVID vaccine mandate took effect. Despite the overwhelming majority of teachers and healthcare workers who are at least partially vaccinated, some still took to the streets in protest. And today, Dr. Fauci gave us a reality check about what we can expect for the holidays. ABC's Ariel Reshef brings us the latest. In New York City today, hundreds taking to the streets to protest the vaccine mandate for 150,000 employees of the country's largest school district just hours after it went into effect. 96% of New York City teachers are now vaccinated with at least one shot, but those who remain unvaccinated out of a job. To those who have not yet gotten vaccinated, it's never too late to get the life-saving vaccine. Get your first dose today you are more than welcome to come back to work. We are not against the vaccine. We are, however, against coercion of anything coming into our bodies against our will. Tonight, confusion for millions of Americans trying to make plans for the holidays. After the CDC took down its online guidance suggesting celebrations are safer when held outdoors and at a distance with meal drop-offs and virtual celebrations. 
They now say new guidance is coming soon. And just 24 hours after saying it's too soon to tell if Americans can gather for the holidays, Dr. Anthony Fauci saying he was taken out of context, adding that vaccinated people can have a traditional holiday. I encourage people, particularly the vaccinated people who are protected, to have a good, normal Christmas with your family. For now, the number of COVID cases is falling. Hospital admissions dropping 15% in the last week. But Dr. Fauci warning numbers could still climb again. The best way to assure that we'll be in good shape as we get into the winter would be to get more and more people vaccinated. Tonight, 15 million Americans who got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine might soon have a booster. The company expected to ask for authorization within days after reporting its second shot significantly boosted protection. There is durable efficacy that lasts for at least five or six months without much evidence of decline for the single shot vaccine. The efficacy is raised to truly outstanding levels with a second shot of the J&J &J vaccine. And Lindsay, tonight, a promising sign for the first time since mid-August, the U.S. reporting under 200,000 new pediatric COVID cases, 173,000 still considered extremely high, but those numbers do seem to be trending in the right direction. Lindsay? Some good news there, Ariel. Our thanks to you when we come back. The man wearing body armor and dressed in scrubs, walking into a hospital and then opening fire. He went to space on TV, and soon he'll be going in real life. But up next, the shooting on board an Amtrak train and the investigation now underway into the motive. Next. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this, this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer cutthroat inc subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Tonight, police are looking for the suspect who ran off after pushing a woman onto an oncoming subway train here in New York City. The victim is in stable condition and is being treated for injuries to her face. Police believe it was an unprovoked attack. Some scary moments aboard an Amtrak train this morning after a person opened fire. Now a DEA agent is dead and another is in critical condition. But what exactly led to this shootout in Arizona? ABC's Kena Whitworth has the details. 
Tonight, a DEA officer is dead and two other members of law enforcement injured after a shooting at an Arizona train station. At 7.40 a.m., this Amtrak train traveling from Los Angeles to New Orleans makes a stop in Tucson. Then just after 8 a.m., shots ring out inside the train. Authorities say DEA agents made contact with two men while performing a routine check of the double-decker passenger train. They were checking uh, for illegal guns, money, drugs. The agents detaining one of the men when the other opened fire. I'm at the train station. 1099 has been shot. A Tucson police officer on the platform responds. He, too, comes under fire. The suspect then barricading himself in the bathroom, exchanging rounds. More officers arriving on scene. Ultimately, it was determined that the suspect in the bathroom was, in fact, deceased. Now, Lindsay, none of the nearly 150 passengers and crew were injured. They were safely evacuated. Authorities know that train left from here in Los Angeles. So now they're trying to figure out when and where those suspects boarded. Lindsay. Kena, thank you. Still ahead here on Prime, so many consequential decisions ahead for the Supreme Court. Why some of the actions of the court's newest members are making court watchers pause on their assumptions. She was the former press secretary for President Trump and worked closely with his wife. Now she's dishing dirt about them both. And it's one of the rare topics of agreement of people on both sides of the aisle. We'll take a look at the issue of Afghan resettlement by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Twitter throwing a bit of shade about their competitors' outages. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was going to say, oh my God. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings mornings. More and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. Live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. With all the political division that we're seeing right now, we turn out to an issue that many agree on, and that's a willingness to welcome Afghan refugees to our shores. We take a look by the numbers. An overwhelming majority, 72% of Americans, say they support granting refugee status to Afghans who worked with the U.S. or Afghan government during our two-decade-long war, as long as they pass security checks. That's according to a new Associated Press poll. Only 9% say that they oppose this, and the rest are undecided. 
This opinion cuts across the political divide. 76% of Democrats would welcome these Afghan refugees, and almost as many Republicans, 74% say the same. 42% of Americans favor granting refugee status to all Afghan refugees who fear living under Taliban rule, even if they did not work with Americans or our allies. Looking at this issue more broadly, studies suggest that American support for refugees seemed to increase as the Trump administration was cutting refugee admissions by 80 percent. For example, support for resettling Syrian refugees in the U.S. rose to 47 percent in 2017 from 40 percent the prior year. But now President Biden has increased the U.S. refugee cap to 125,000, and that does not include thousands of Afghans fleeing the Taliban or some Haitians at our southern border. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight, the most difficult test of her life. That's how the Florida governor is describing his wife's new fight against breast cancer. More on that coming up. Plus, our conversation with rock legend Peter Frampton about the complexities of fame. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Crews scrambling to clean the blackened beaches and waters lining the stretch of California's most iconic coastal cities. This oil spill constitutes one of the most devastating situations that our community has dealt with in decades. Up to 130,000 gallons of crude have leaked into the Pacific Ocean off Orange County, killing wildlife and shutting down some of the state's most iconic shorelines. You were the one who had to tell Melania about the former porn star Stormy Daniels' lawsuit. What was that moment like? That was tough. Her reaction on that phone call was very okay. Okay, it wasn't surprise, it wasn't anger. She was very stoic. Former White House Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham tells Good Morning America that she's hoping President Trump decides not to run again in 2024. He's clearly the front runner in the Republican Party. Everybody's showing their fealty to him. And I want to just warn people that once he takes office, if he were to win, he doesn't have to worry about re-election anymore. He will be about revenge. He will probably have some pretty draconian policies that, that go on. There were conversations a lot of times that people would say, that'll be the second term, that'll be the second term, meaning we won't have to worry about, you know, a re-election. 
Police in Philadelphia still looking to determine the motive behind a fatal shooting at a hospital in a shootout with their own officers. Investigators say a 55-year-old nursing assistant wearing scrubs shot and killed a co-worker at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital this morning. The gunman then drove off in a U-Haul. Four officers encountered him near a school and they traded gunshots. The suspect and two officers were hit. They are all, though, expected to survive. Investigators believe the gunman targeted his fellow nursing assistant to do harm. No word on the relationship between the two or what led to the shooting. Loved ones of Mia Marcano are demanding justice after a body believed to be the 19-year-old college student was found slain in a wooded area of Orlando. The family's lawyer saying more could have been done. There are young students who live at this apartment complex today who are passing around a petition. We're learning that there weren't even security cameras in, in a number of places at this complex. More than a week after her disappearance, cell phone records from the prime suspect, maintenance worker Armando Caballero, led them to that grim discovery. Investigators allege Caballero used a master key to enter the student's apartment the same day she vanished. Three days later, Caballero was found dead from an apparent suicide. The First Lady of Florida has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Governor Ron DeSantis announced the news about his wife Casey in a statement earlier today saying that she faces the most difficult test of her life but will not give up. Casey DeSantis is 41 years old. The couple have three children who are four, three, and one. No other details were given about her condition or her treatment. Space, the final frontier. He's actually going into space. Star Trek actor William Shatner set to blast off next week on board a rocket from Jeff Bezos' space travel company, Blue Origin. At 90 years old, Shatner will become the oldest person ever to enter space. This is Captain Jim Kirk of the Enterprise. In a press release, the man who played Captain T. Kirk said, I've heard about space for a long time now. I'm taking the opportunity to see it for myself. Meanwhile, Shatner's trek into space on October 12th will be with three others, including Audrey Powers. She is Blue Origin's Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations. I've had a great deal to do with all these preparations for human flight. I have wanted to fly in space since birth. Uh, by the way, this enterprise follows Blue Origin's first flight in late July. Beamed up for sure. Welcome back, everyone, now to the Supreme Court. Starting a new term that could bring some of the most consequential rulings in years, including landmark decisions about abortion. This is public debate over the court intensifies, and as approval of the justices sinks to its lowest point in decades. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. As Americans snatch up guns at record pace and shooting deaths soar. This one and this one. The Supreme Court will decide this fall whether there's a fundamental right to carry a handgun outside the home. It would mean that you could expect more people to be carrying handguns in places like New York City, Boston, and Los Angeles. The court will also decide whether to reinstate the death sentence for the Boston Marathon bomber, allow the government to keep secret details of so-called CIA black sites, and whether parents in Maine can use taxpayer funds to send their kids to religious schools. But the biggest showdown ahead is over abortion and whether to overturn 50 years of precedent since Roe versus Wade. Roe v. Wade is on thin ice. At the moment, it really feels more as if it's a question of when, not if, and how, not whether. The blockbuster cases will play out before the most conservative court in a generation, one that includes three appointees of President Donald Trump, whose impact on the bench is just now coming into view. The six conservatives on the court sometimes disagree on the speed at which the court should be moving, but there's much less evidence that they disagree on the direction. 538's analysis of the justice's ideology reveals an unmistakable move to the right. Sonia Sotomayor, now the most liberal justice, Clarence Thomas remains the most conservative. But no longer is just one justice considered a swing vote, but now potentially three in the middle. All conservatives, Chief Justice John Roberts and Trump appointees Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. Barrett, for example, voted with Roberts and Kavanaugh over 90 percent of the time. Based on what we know so far, she seems like she's going to be a core component of the conservative triad at the center of the court. After Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing a year ago, Democrats sounded the alarm about Barrett. A judicial torpedo they are firing at the ACA. But the court's newest member has so far defied expectations on both sides, voting to uphold Obamacare and staking out middle ground in a dispute over faith and LGBT rights. I think we would agree that there's really not 
any circumstance we can think of in which racial discrimination would be permitted um, as a religious exemption. Can you think of any example where an objection to same-sex marriage would justify an exemption? It was very, very significant that the expectation that Justice Barrett would be a reliable uh, vote for the most doctrinaire originalist position has not materialized. Brett Kavanaugh was in the majority more than any other justice last term in oral arguments exhibiting pragmatism and empathy as in his defense of college athletes. The schools are conspiring with competitors, agreeing with competitors, I'll say that, to pay no salaries to the workers who are making the schools billions of dollars. And that just seems entirely circular and, and even somewhat disturbing. The justices' public words and writings are being scrutinized for clues and how they might decide the divisive disputes ahead. We don't know what a Brett Kavanaugh, who is no longer beholden to John Roberts to get the deciding vote, will say about abortion. And we don't know the same about, about Justice Barrett. Yeah. Barrett and Kavanaugh cast votes this summer to allow Texas to move forward with its abortion ban on procedural grounds, breaking with Chief Justice John Roberts, who would have put it on hold. This Texas prohibition on abortion after about six weeks is clearly unconstitutional. The question is when this U.S. Supreme Court has before it this law or a law like it, whether it will change the constitutional law of abortion. To some, it's a sign of where the court is headed, fueling a public perception of the justices as politically motivated. I thought that that was a very bad decision, and I dissented. After the Texas decision, public approval of the Supreme Court plummeted, down nine points from July, 18 points from last year. Fewer Americans approve of the Supreme Court now than at any point in the last two decades of Gallup polling. Not since Bush against Gore has the public perception of the court's legitimacy seemed so seriously threatened. A crisis not lost on the justices themselves. We have lost the capacity even, I think, as, as leaders to not allow others to manipulate our um, institutions when we don't get the outcomes that we like. Justice Thomas, the most senior conservative, echoing Justice Breyer, the most senior liberal. If the public sees judges as politicians in robes, its confidence in the courts and in the rule of law itself can only diminish. I hope and expect that the court will retain its authority but that authority, like the rule of law, depends on trust. Hoping a court at a crossroads can protect that trust as Americans await major decisions in what could be a blockbuster year ahead. For ABC News, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin for that. We're going to have that song in our heads the rest of the day. That was Grammy Award-winning artist and rock legend Peter Frampton performing Baby, I Love Your Way acoustically at his home. Frampton, who shot to worldwide fame in 1976 when his double album Frampton Comes Alive hit number one on the charts and to this day remains one of the best-selling live albums of all time. Frampton discusses the complexities of fame and the value of resilience in his memoir, Do You Feel Like I Do?, which is being released in paperback tomorrow. Welcome to the show. 40 years ago, the album Frampton Comes Alive just exploded, selling more than 17 million copies around the world. You had been moderately successful both as a guitar player and vocalist, but this album really solidified you as a superstar at age 25 and a sex symbol to boot. Tell us about that time and, and how your life and career changed. Well, um, I was really... Um, Building very slowly up until that point, I'd had uh, four solo records out, um, and they had, you know, not really done much. So when the album came out uh, in '76 uh, and exploded, it was it changed my life um, virtually overnight. It was a huge change in my life when. Everybody uh, knew who I was and and recognized me everywhere, which was sort of great to start with, but then got a little bit of a 
pesky thing. <laughs> but you can't go to where you'd like to go, like hang out in the mu in the music store or the right. record store, you know. But um, in the end, you know, I I just sort of got used got used to this new level of fame, and uh, I I've, I've been pretty grounded kind of guy. I had about three weeks of going nuts. Thing, but, <laughs> Just three weeks. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, you know, all right, three months. Uh, um, <laughs> so Frampton Comes Alive it certainly was a high point, but but you weren't able to follow up on that success and ran into some snags along the way due to some some poor career choices, a near fatal car accident, and bad business deals, which left you in debt and adrift. Can you talk a bit about the pressure that you faced and how this all impacted your mental health? It definitely. Um, put me in a place where I, you know, was abusing myself and and self-medicating and stuff like that, um, which seems to happen. Um, but I think that because I've always been a survivor, um, I used the time to um, just work out what was going to happen next and how was I going to... I tried various different things, def different projects, and, and I've always been... You know, when I when I fail at something, I learn the most from that, um, and, and it just makes you stronger. I think. You talked about how you were a survivor. How at one point you were self medicating. For people who are still in the midst of their failure, who are still self medicating at this point, how did you survive? What got you to that point? Well, I think um, just like most people um, in that situation, I bottomed out. Um, I ended up in a police car in the back seat with my hands behind my back. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, it just took once in that situation uh, to realize that I had to go and get help. Mm -hmm. And then I went to AA and thank you for all the people in all the rooms everywhere around the world where I went. That, that brought me back. Um, now it's, I'm working on my 19th year of no drinking. You went back to, to playing your guitar, recording with artists like Ringo Starr, George Harrison, and David Bowie. How did you adapt to being behind the scenes, focusing solely on guitar and touring as part of a band after being the front man? Well, I, I've been a front man, I've been a side man, and I've been a front man, and I've been a side man all my life. I never wanted to be the front guy, but in the end, I realized that I did want to go out there and try it myself and write the songs for me and um, and be a solo artist. Um, so it's it's happened. I would I, I play with people now. That's my default position, really, is the guitar player and um, singing. I had to sing if I wanted to front my own band. Um, I guess I could have got a singer, but I decided to try it, and it seemed to work out. Yeah, I, I think that worked out just fine. Uh, back in 2019, you launched a farewell tour, which was ultimately canceled uh, due to the pandemic. Instead, we got the Peter, Peter Frampton Stays Inside tour. Tell us about that. Well, we did a T-shirt. When everything got locked down, we did a T-shirt. Uh, I started off doing a video about washing hands, which people might have seen, which went on for days. And um, of course, and then we decided, I decided that maybe we should use the front cover of Friend Who Comes Alive. Uh, but I put a mask on it, so um, we, we <laughs> brought those out. Peter Frampton, it has just been a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight and sharing your story. Do You Feel Like I Do, a memoir is now available in paperback wherever books are sold. Thank you, Lindsay. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Bubba Wallace becomes only the second black driver in NASCAR history with a Cup Series victory after a rain-shortened race at Talladega. Our congratulations to him. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
next hour, we're staying on top of several things, including what are the next steps for Democrats struggling to find common ground for their priorities, and our conversation with Shannon Doherty in her fight against cancer. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love, the hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. If you weren't able to get on Facebook, Instagram, or that WhatsApp group chat today, here's why. All three apps owned by Facebook experienced a massive outage. The outage comes just one day after a whistleblower came out with allegations that the tech failed to crack down on hate speech on the platform because it chose profits instead. A Texas man has been sentenced to 45 days in jail for his role in the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. DOJ prosecutors recommended Matt Mazzocco spend three months in home confinement and probation after pleading guilty to a misdemeanor. This morning, a district judge ruled to impose a harsher sentence instead and called the treatment of Capitol rioters lenient. And two Americans were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology today. David Julius and Artem Potaputian are recognized for their discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. They were able to pinpoint the very gene responsible for sensing heat by using capcassin, the chemical that makes chili peppers spicy. Turning now to the battle in Washington over President Biden's agenda, those two infrastructure bills that threaten to divide the Democratic Party and a separate debt ceiling showdown with Republicans. Chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega reports from the White House. With just two weeks until the U.S. runs out of money to pay its bills, President Biden today sounding the alarm, saying if that happens, it would be like a meteor crashing into the economy. It starts with a simple truth. The United States is a nation that pays its bills and always has. From its inception, we have never defaulted. The president warning of dire consequences, interest rates would soar and stock prices plunge, sending markets into a free fall, military salaries frozen, social security benefits on hold, millions of jobs lost. Congress has until October 18th to raise the debt ceiling, but Republicans refuse to budge. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell today sending a letter to President Biden saying Democrats are on their own. The majority needs to stop sleepwalking toward yet another preventable crisis. But when Republicans controlled the Senate in recent years, Democrats joined them three times to raise the debt ceiling. Now, nearly 98 percent of the current debt was accrued before President Biden took office, including nearly $7.8 trillion during the Trump administration. And tonight, the situation remains a stalemate. So it is possible that the U.S. will not pay its debt. That is possible. I can't believe that that will be the end result because the consequence is so dire. I don't believe that. But can I guarantee it? If I could, I would, but I can't. Can't guarantee it just yet. Cecilia Vega joins us now from the White House. Cecilia Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says that the Senate will vote on the debt limit later this week, even though Republicans still oppose taking action. 
Yeah, that's exactly where this stalemate is at this hour. Lindsey, he wants, uh, Schumer wants a vote for later this week, but the reality is they need 10 Republicans to get on board and they do not have those votes. Now, we've been saying this deadline is October 18th, but Lindsey, the Treasury Secretary, she has issued a dire warning about even waiting until the last minute. October 18th, she says that's even too late. Waiting with all of this uncertainty hanging over all of this debt ceiling debate is going to do serious harm, she says, to business and consumer confidence, let alone the financial markets. And, and Cecilia, the president sounded much more confident about his policy agenda, telling reporters that most of his party supports his plans. What's the White House doing to win over those two Senate holdouts? Well, these negoti negotiations are still going on. The president met virtually today with some of these progressives, really trying to understand where their holdup is and talking with them on that front. He's going to meet with uh, moderates, uh, Democratic moderates, later in the week. But he did say today, we got a little bit of a hint of where his head on this, you know, that $3.5 trillion price tag for all those social programs we've been talking about. President Biden said he is willing to come down on that, but he hasn't given a dollar amount for where he stands on it, but it will be less than $3.5 trillion. Trillion. The reality is, Lindsay, though, this is still being debated. The party is still at an impasse. They're still at a stalemate. They don't have an agreement, and those negotiations at this hour are still going on. Cecilia Vega reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Cecilia. And now to that oil spill disaster off the coast of Southern California. Crews desperately trying to stop the crude oil from spreading after 144,000 gallons poured into the Pacific Ocean via an underwater pipeline. ABC's Matt Gutman brings us this report. Tonight, crews racing to contain one of the largest oil spills in California history. Up to 130,000 gallons of crude have leaked into the Pacific Ocean off Orange County, killing wildlife and shutting down some of the state's most iconic shorelines. Officials say the pipeline, which is the source of the leak, is 17 and a half miles long. The spill located in this area, about four and a half miles off the coast of Huntington Beach. Late today, divers pinpointing a key area of concern. The Coast Guard looking into the possibility that a ship's anchor caused the rupture. These ships are uh, anchored and many are waiting entry and uh, in the course of transit it is it is possible that they would transit over a pipeline. Teams on boats deploying boom to contain the oil, others scooping it up with skimmers, desperately trying to prevent the nearly 13 square mile slick from spreading further down a coastline teeming with wildlife. Hopefully this doesn't turn out too bad, you know, I'm just concerned about the the sea life and the birds. We went out on the water and saw it firsthand. So I just bent down and this is what I scooped up. This is the kind of oil that's being leaked and you can see that it's hardened once it hits the water, but the ocean here is covered with this stuff. Fish and wildlife experts rescuing birds from that sludge. Residents here devastated. Well, it's heartbreaking. I, I'm, I live here locally and I just came down to see how widespread it was. And it's quite disappointing. The CEO of Amplify Energy, the company that owns the pipeline, saying they notified the Coast Guard early Saturday of a possible spill and capped both ends of the pipe by Sunday, claiming no more oil was leaking. The company releasing a statement today saying it's working cooperatively with officials on the scene. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. The ability to get an abortion is among the biggest cases facing the Supreme Court this year, and many on both sides believe this could be the year Roe versus Wade is overturned. That landmark case remains one of the most polarizing issues in American society. And now, just imagine if you were the baby whose biological mother famously fought to have you aborted. The burden and weight that you might carry if you were then compelled to hold that secret for decades. Tonight, in her first television interview, we speak with that baby, now all grown up, at the heart of one of this nation's most bitter fights. A lot of people didn't know that I existed, that she was able to have the abortion. Shelley Lynn Thornton was two and a half years old, completely oblivious to her role in history on January 22, 1973, when the landmark case Roe v. Wade was decided in the Supreme Court. When you are able to really think about the idea that your mere conception brought about arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history, mm -hmm. what's the impact on you now? I understand that it has nothing to do with me. It's, it doesn't revolve around me. I wasn't the one who like created this law. I'm not the one who created this movement. 
Her only involvement? She just happened to be at the center of an unwanted pregnancy her mother wanted to end. As much as this case was personal, seemingly pitting a mother against her unborn child, publicly it pitted Americans against each other. The country was deadlocked in a bitter moral battle over what constituted life. Is there any part of you that has ever given any thought to, boy, I'm kind of glad that law went into effect after I was born? I just don't think about it. To me, I want it to be a non-issue, so I ignore it thinking that if I ignore it long enough and hard enough, it'll go away, <laughs> but it never does. And so at 51 years old, after decades shrouded in secrecy, the woman who was thought of only as the Roe baby is ready to tell her story. Now you're confronting it, really. I've ignored it for this many years and it hasn't gone away and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's like now the only thing that I can do is just to meet it head on. Her biological mother, Norma McCorvey, a cleaning woman from Katy, Texas, was 22 when she found herself pregnant for the third time. By 1970, she'd already given up two of her girls for adoption, but it was a desire to terminate her third pregnancy that led Norma to file a lawsuit against the state of Texas. She never did have the procedure, but more than two years later, against tremendous odds, Norma, who filed anonymously under the pseudonym Jane Rowe, won. The Supreme Court today ruled that abortion is completely a private matter to be decided by mother and doctor in the first three months of pregnancy. By that time, Norma's third baby, Shelly, was already a toddler growing up with a family she says she loved. What was it like growing up uh, with, with Ruth and Billy? I had the best time. It was always an adventure. There was always like something fun going on because we had a big family. And you felt loved? Oh yeah, completely, 100%. Did you ever look for your biological parents? No. But in 1989, Norma was looking for her. It was the same year actress Roseanne Barr had a media frenzied reunion with the daughter she gave up as a teen. And Shelley believes that Norma, seeing the attention it brought, wanted the same. You're 18, 10 days before your 19th birthday, and somebody says, what? I walked past this van and these people like jumped out of this van and they were calling me and I turned around and they were like, are you Shelly? And I was, I go, yeah. And they were like, well, we, we've been looking for you. Shelly says she was tricked into meeting reporters from the National Enquirer who then revealed that her biological mother was Norma McCorvey, AKA Jane Rowe, the poster child for abortion. My whole thinking is that Oh God, everybody's gonna hate me because everyone's gonna blame me for abortion being legal. I just completely broke down. For a long time, you kept it a secret. You didn't tell anybody who your biological mother was. What kind of weight was that and burden for you to carry that for so many years? It's a lot of weight. It's, it's, it's pretty big. I feel that it was always hard for me to form relationships with people because I, I felt like I was always holding something back. Like they never really got like 100% me. I still carry that um, and I probably always will. As an 18 year old, had you thought anything about Roe v. Wade or abortion? I never really grew up knowing anything about abortion because it was just never, not a thing that was talked about in our family. Like if a family member had a baby, they couldn't take care of it, then somebody else in the family took it and took care of it. In the 80s, Roe v. Wade was quickly becoming a partisan issue. Many Republicans like President Ronald Reagan took a firm stance against it. We're told about a woman's right to control her own body, but doesn't the unborn child have a higher right and that is to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And those angered by the ruling sometimes resorted to violence, killing lives in the name of saving them. They bombed the clinics because God told them to do it. In the decades since, there have been several challenges to the ruling, but none as serious as recent legislation. Mississippi, which only has one abortion clinic left, is going before the Supreme Court this fall to ask the conservative majority to throw out Roe and roll back abortion rights nationwide. 
While in Texas, where Norma sued for an abortion all those years ago, a recent bill known as SB8 has already succeeded at banning abortions after six weeks, with no exceptions for rape or incest, empowering civilians to enforce it with lawsuits against doctors who unlawfully perform the procedure. Clinics say it's effectively ended abortion in America's second most populated state and galvanized people on both sides. And while this decades-long debate continues to rage across the country, Shelley wants no parts of it. Concerned either side would be all too eager to make her the face of their movement. Do you have an opinion about whether women should be allowed to have abortions? I do. It's an opinion that I keep pretty close to my chest just because I don't want either side or both sides coming at me. I'm not going to let either side use me. Though people watching are going to say, oh, she has a cross on. That must be a message that, you know, it's her religious beliefs that she's trying to uh, convey without answering the question. No. So this, this cross is my sister cross. Um, Jennifer and I have matching necklaces so that we always have each other close. Jennifer Ferguson is Norma's second daughter, who she also gave up for adoption. Much like Shelley, she too grew up in a loving home with a doting mother and a father nicknamed Dr. Wonderful, who adored her. My childhood was, it was amazing. I had great parents, Donna and Steve, who raised me. My dad was an anesthesiologist. My mom worked in a podiatrist's office and my sister was in and out of college. I never did without. With one exception, it wasn't until about a decade ago that Shelley first met her half-sister, Jennifer. Unlike Shelley, Jennifer wasn't burdened by the knowledge that her birth mother tried to abort her. As a result, Jennifer's relationship with Norma was quite different from Shelley's. Since we're here in Texas, you lived all your life in Texas, and, and a big conversation now is SB8. Do you have thoughts on it? I think it's a, it's a little bit scary that people can judge how women, what they're going to do with their bodies. I, I, I have a problem with that. Um, not that I'm pro-choice, pro-life, 100% either side. I, I will always feel that it's wrong. Did you ever try to convince Shelly to meet Norma? No. I did not because I knew from a very early stage with Shelly what horrible things that Norma did to her as a young child, and I would never force that on her, ever. Norma was a complicated figure. When her lawyers, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, met her, she was seemingly the perfect candidate, a poor woman unable to afford the trip out of the state for an abortion. But what they got was a spitfire who took liberties with the truth and was haunted by a traumatic upbringing. Prior to her death, Norma would go on to switch sides multiple times, vacillating between pro-choice and pro-life, depending on which was more profitable and attention-grabbing at the time. Norma is a wild, a wild woman. She wants to be the center of attention. There was a, a major headline in June 1989. It says, National Enquirer finds Jane Rose baby. Mm -hmm. and, and Norma was quoted saying that she was ready to take her in my arms and give her my love and be her friend, her being you. Right. Did you ever feel that that was true? No. It became apparent to me really quickly that the only reason why she wanted to reach out to me and find me was because she wanted to use me for publicity. Have you forgiven her? No. Never will? No. Why? A lot of reasons. Um, mostly because I feel that she could have handled things a lot better than she did. She could have been more upfront with what she actually wanted from me than trying to do, you know, like the warm mother-daughter reconciliation movie of the week kind of thing. Have you been able to reconcile being this unwilling participant in history? <laughs> yes and no, but I think a lot of people don't understand that Norma was taken 
advantage of in her circumstances, but I think she also took advantage of both sides. Norma passed in 2017, once again shocking the world before she died with the revelation that she was paid by the pro-life movement to switch sides in the FX doc, AKA Jane Roe. This is my deathbed confession. <laughs> Did they use you as a trophy? Of course. I was the big fish. She passed away before Jennifer could make it to the hospital. And while Shelley considered going to visit Norma on her deathbed, ultimately, she decided against it. Why did you decide never to meet Norma? She didn't deserve to meet me. She, she never did anything um, in her life to get that privilege back. She never... Um, she never expressed genuine feeling for me or genuine remorse for doing the things that she did, saying the things that she did. So you have no regrets that you never met her? No regrets. Norma once said of her daughters that she gave them a chance at living by giving them away. This was a birthday. But what they're most grateful for is that she gave them each other. What do you all bring to each other's lives at this point? Support. Comfort. Most definitely. Togetherness. Yeah. Family. Family. Yeah. Our thanks to both Shelley and Jennifer. And still to come, find out why the sudden death of a cartoonist is raising eyebrows overseas. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I like you. Yeah. Like so, you. what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. President of the United States is having an affair with an intern. Someone needs to go public. I promised him that I would not tell anyone. We just gotta show him what really happened. Are you sure you have enough evidence? You are chaos. You are mayhem. These allegations are false. Mom, I'm in trouble. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer cutthroat inc subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. 
We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. At least five people were killed Sunday after a bomb went off outside of a mosque in Kabul, according to the Taliban. No group claimed responsibility immediately after the attack, but suspicion fell on the Islamic State, who've been behind other attacks since U.S. troops withdrew from Afghanistan in August. Taliban forces carried out a raid in an Islamic State hideout just hours after the bombing. Several insurgents were killed, according to officials. China sent more than 50 planes into Taiwan's air defense zone over the weekend, marking 13 consecutive days of aerial invasions by the nation. China also sent 38 planes October 1st, which marked the 72nd anniversary of the formation of China's current government. China has been using these tactics since mid-2020 to test Taiwan's nerve and lower their morale. China sees Taiwan as a territory, while the island views itself as sovereign. A Swedish cartoonist who lived for years under police protection from Al Qaeda died in a car crash Sunday. Lars Vilks lived in constant fear after receiving death threats for his 2007 sketch of the Prophet Muhammad with a dog's body. Vilks and two bodyguards were killed in a fiery head on collision with a truck in Sweden. Police say there's no indication that the crash was anything other than a traffic accident. Vilks was 75 years old. Shannon Doherty is a warrior. A part of her mission now is to help change people's misconceptions about what it means to live with stage four cancer. And she's doing it by living her best life. Our Juju Chang reports. She was the tough high schooler in the iconic 90s show, Beverly Hills 90210. Oh my God. And the 2008 reboot. Oh, I'm so sorry I'm late. My flight got delayed. Shannon Doherty has been a celebrated actress for decades, but more recently, it's her health that's been in the spotlight, revealing her stage four breast cancer on GMA in 2020 after being in remission for five years. You want to own your cancer story. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather people hear it from me. Today, Doherty says she isn't just living with cancer, she is thriving. I'm living life. I'm spending a lot of time with friends and family and working. Your birth mother is standing in your house? When were you going to tell us that you found her? Doherty bringing her talents to two Lifetime movies, debuting this month, Dying to Belong and List of a Lifetime. It's okay. Does work feel different for you at this stage in your career? I think work was always very fulfilling to me, but in a way it's become even more fulfilling. A lot of people who get diagnosed with stage four, they sort of get written off. It's assumed that they cannot work or they can't work at their full capacity. And that is not true. And that is something that I would really like for people to sort of stop assuming and give us a chance to prove them wrong. Improvements in treatments and when they're given are known as protocols. They've increased life expectancy, making living with stage four cancer for some more like a chronic disease. Give us a sense of where you are in your treatment plan and, and what's accounting for the fact that you look and feel so great. I'm still on my first protocol, which is a very, very, very big thing. So it's kind of like you just want to last on your on your protocols as long as possible so that you don't run out of protocols. In her 20s, the 90210 star was known as a difficult wild child. Doherty says that reputation came from speaking up at a time when women were expected to keep their mouths shut. It was a very different time to be an actress because a lot of the men in the business were maybe not as collaborative with women as perhaps they are now. Um, it was definitely more of a, you know, just get on your mark and say your line and do your job. And I, I think because of that, I was extremely rebellious. And I think because of all the names, the labels that were given to me, I sort of retracted even more into myself and became even more defensive and even more shut down. But cancer, she says, changed that all. You really have to dig deep to, to face cancer. And, and in that, you find all this stuff that you had hidden away. And it's beautiful things that you find. You know, you find the vulnerability, you find your trust in people again. You find forgiveness. You've been quoted as saying that you don't believe in bucket lists. What did you mean by that? I like to say that those are goals because a bucket list almost feels like those things that you check off before you die. 
And I never want to operate like that. I just want to operate as I don't have things to check off because I'm going to keep fighting to stay alive. Goals instead of a bucket list like that. And our thanks to Juju. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. now and America this morning the best